Salutations, respective viewers. It's George from Ireland here, and here I am um, across the street from number 46, Lower Belgrave Street, in London's very shishi uh, Belgravia district. So um, this house behind me was the house of the Earl of Lucan, and uh, this was where um, one of Britain's unsolved mysteries begins. Uh, near on uh, 50 years ago, this occurred. Well, it was November 1973. Um, no, sorry, 74. So more like 45 years ago, this occurred. Um, so uh, Lord Lucan, he was um, born into an aristocratic family. The surname was Bingham. They had that title from, an, from a place in County Dublin. Although it was an Irish title, um, Lord Lucan, he never lived in Ireland. So, so far as I'm aware, he never actually went to Ireland either. Um, it was a title taken off Patrick Sarsfield, who'd been a supporter of James II. But anyway, so um, Lord Lucan, he had a typical upper class upbringing um, with nannies and prep school and then Eton. Um, and uh, so he'd been evacuated in the Second World War and was at Eton just after the Second World War. Um, and then he served in the uh, Coldstream Guards um, for two years in West Germany. Um, 1953 to 55. Remember, Germany was divided in those days, West Germany being the pro American part of the country. Um, so, NATO troops were stationed there. So, he worked at a private bank for a while. He didn't um, go on to tertiary education um, and he had a taste for gambling. He had very expensive tastes, which was, was probably part of his downfall. So, then he um, uh, married an upper class young lady in 1964 and um, she was good for him in terms of emolument. She brought a lot of money to the marriage. They were blessed with a daughter and a son, so um, they lived here. So he gave up his banking job and decided to be a professional gambler. He was part of the Claremont Club, and the Claremont Club was at Barclays Square. I could do a video on so that sometime. And um, uh, Sir James Goldsmith was um, probably a leading light in the Claremont Club. So in the 1950s, um, uh, most gambling was illegal in the United Kingdom. Um, however, at private clubs, it was allowed if you were a member of the club. So what he decided to do, um, Jimmy Goldsmith and a few others, Mike Aspinall, was to set up a club and gambling would go on there. And it was huge scale gambling and they made it glamorous. It was for very wealthy, upper class, um, elegant people um, gambling. But huge amounts of money would, would change hands in an evening. And it was all thought to be very honorable. They always had to be dressed up to sort of the nines to go. And there'd be plenty of hard liquor and cigars being consumed during these gambling sessions. So, um, Lord Lucan was, was skillful at cards and other games of roulette. So far, so good. But of course, sometimes um, his luck failed him and Lady Luck, in fact, pissed on his parade. So he began losing money and chasing his losses and got worse and worse um, by the early 70s. Um, and there were other, other problems for him. He was hugely in debt and his marriage broke down as well. Um, so that was that. So he moved out and he was living in a nearby street at his mother's place. Um, he was originally known as Lord Bingham, his father had died, then he inherited the title, the Earl of Lucan. So, um, seen, uh, Lucky Lucan was becoming increasingly unlucky in financial terms. So, they had a, a nanny called Sandra Rivett, she was 29 years old. She was married, split up with her husband, she had a child, being brought up by her, by her parents. Anyway, so Thursday was Sandra Rivett's night off. She had a new boyfriend, so she usually go out with her boyfriend Thursday night, that was that. Otherwise, she lived in the flat. So, um, uh, yeah, so Lord Lucan and his wife were restrained and there was a custody battle going on over the children. Um, even his worst enemy would admit that he really did uh, adore his children. Anyhow, so one Thursday evening in early November 1974, um, uh, Lady Lucan was, well, I'm not quite sure where she was, but Lord Lucan let himself in because he still had a key to this plan, um, to this house, and he waited in a room in the dark. Now, part of this is simply reconstructed. We've got to try and piece together the jigsaw because there's no witness has ever testified as what actually happened. Some of this is educated guesswork. So Lord Lucan um, waits in a room with the lights off and the light switch is some distance from the door, as in someone would enter the room and have to walk several steps across the room to switch on the light. And he waits there for his wife to come in, um, intending to batter her to death. And lo and behold, the door opens and a woman comes in. There's enough ambient light, he can tell it's a woman. So fine, he's there with his lead piping and he whacks this female on the head several times and she falls down, he's satisfied that she's dead. Then Lord Lucan switches on the light, only to discover the woman he has killed is not his wife. It's the nanny. But the nanny's not supposed to be there. Thursday's her night off, as he knew. 
However, on this particular Thursday, she chose not to go out for the evening. So he had accidentally killed uh, the nanny and he leaves the body there and doesn't know what to do. But sometime or later, Lady Lucan comes along and she goes into the same room and to her horror, discovers this dead and bloody body of the nan nanny Sandra Rivet. And she shrieks, Lord Luc Lucan attacks her. There's a physical altercation. He gives up quite quickly and he even apologizes to her for murdering this woman. She claimed that she'd heard his voice earlier on um, saying something when he was killing the nanny. I think Lady Lucan was somewhere else in the house and had come down. And the children were there and they overheard some of this as well because they were woken up. So um, then he um, uh, shuts her in the bathroom. And anyway, Lady Lucan manages to climb out the window, run to a nearby pub and shriek and raise the alarm. You know, someone's just been murdered. So Lord, Lord Lucan makes good his escape. Now, um, his movements for the next couple of days can be traced where he went where he was seen, letters he sent up until the 8th of November that year, just a couple of days later, and after that, not a trace. However, the theories are rife as to what he did, where he went, and people said that the Eton Mafia protected him, not literally the underworld, but he had friends in high places, he was highborn, he had plenty of money, though he was hugely in debt by this time. That stress may have driven over the edge. He was taking obiturates, which will have uh, occluded his judgment, supposed, supposed to um, make him feel more tranquil, because he was obviously feeling quite tense because um, you know the, the solids are about to hit the fan in terms of his debts, which could no longer be extended. Um, and the, the interest was obviously increasing ferociously, rapaciously. Um, and what was he gonna do? And then he had this fraught relationship with his estranged wife and wanted his access to his children. So where did he go? We don't know. And um, the police were questioning his various aristocratic friends and they're mostly keeping stum. Did they hide in one of his estates? His, his, they knew where his car was, the police impounded its car pretty quick and they found his passport and all the rest of it, they were able to freeze his bank accounts. Um, and uh, so could he leave the country under a false passport, somehow smuggled out. And the theories have never stopped where he was, where he's been seen. Was he in um, India and in Goa? There was some um, white guy who was hanging around there for ages. It seemed a bit doolally, known as Jungly Pete. No, it wasn't him. Was he in Gabon when John Stonehouse, that Labour MP, faked his own death, did a disappearing trick, and was finally arrested in Australia. People thought it was Lord Lucan initially. No, it wasn't, it was John Stonehouse. So nobody knows where Lord Lucan went or what happened to him. Did he commit suicide? Uh, there's all sorts of theories. There's no suicide note being found, and there's no, um, uh, no body has ever been discovered, so we don't know. Now, his ingenious plan of murdering his wife um, was not really uh, so smart. He hadn't really thought this through. So, okay, he's gonna kill her on a Thursday night when the nanny's not there. But, um, so that's one witness who's not there. But the children are still there, they're gonna hear something. Um, and uh, then you've got blood all over the carpet, all over the walls, all over his clothes. And what, how are you gonna dispose of the body? So uh, that was that. Anyway, he had no beef with the nanny, he had no motive to want to kill Sandra Rivet. But that's that, so Lord Lucan um, has never been found. In 1999 there was a, was a case and it was, he was declared legally dead um, for probate purposes so that things could be inherited. But yeah, it was, it was hugely in debt. So his daughter and son live on, and his daughter, she's married to the very prominent barrister, Michael Block, the, um, the biographer of Jeremy Thorpe. So um, Lord Lucan's daughter says she believes her father is innocent, and we must accept the presumption of innocence. Uh, there are other possibilities. Somebody else broke in and killed uh, the nanny, and that it was that, his, um, that Lady Lucan misidentified a man as being a husband, and actually wasn't her husband, and that's that. So we have to assume that he didn't do it. All right, so there we are. That is the mystery of Lord Lucan. Speculation still abounds as to what became of him.